It's a great pleasure to welcome Linda Hawken today. Linda Hawken, how should I describe you? You are a trumpet player, you are a <laughs> conductor, but most important, you are managing director of one of the most important music publishing companies in the world, Edition Peters. We are very, very happy to have you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining this video. Since a few years, the International Mendelssohn Academy and Edition Peters have a wonderful collaboration. And we are very, very thankful about that. Linda, please let me know, when did you first time heard about the Mendelssohn Academy? Well, uh, four years ago, when I uh, moved across from London to this uh, amazing city of Leipzig uh, to uh, look after the Leipzig company uh, of Edition Peters, it timed in with your, your, your 2016 IMAR Academy. Uh, and it was, uh, I couldn't believe this extraordinary creative two weeks of uh, music making and pedagogical activity. Um, so I just was so keen to get involved and to find out more. Concerning the creativity, you made us a wonderful gift in 2018. You created exclusively for the participants of the Mendelssohn Academy an, a piano anthology, yes, um, a special edition of very, very special pieces inside. Um, I'm still overwhelmed <laughs> by the creativity you put in creating this anthology. Maybe you can explain us on what base did you select the pieces yes, inside? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you'll see the front cover there is not our usual green cover. It's, it's actually a photograph of the Henriksen family dining room at uh, Talstrasse 10 in Leipzig, which was this amazing center of music making um, from 1874 onwards. And so many great composers uh, visited the, the Edition Peters offices um, and the Henriksen family. So I wanted to really encapsulate um, really the, the, the story of Peters very simply and highlight some of the extraordinary repertoire that maybe some of your uh, amazing uh, attendees didn't know about, uh, especially the Marc-André Hamelin, uh, Virtuosic Studies, the Georges Schiffre, uh, craziness of, of, of those transcriptions, um, moving to the, the Chopin and, and the really new light that, that our Chopin edition is, is bringing uh, to, to the sources. But I finished the anthology with the simplest of pieces to contrast with the great virtuosity um, of the Hamelin and Schiffre with a wonderful one-page piece by Grieg uh, last Saturday night, which he would have played to the Henriksen family, the owners of Edition Peters, in that very room. And it's a jewel. It's, it's, it's simple, but it just sums up Grieg's amazing mastery of compositional style. And it's not that well known. So I just wanted to share and, and encourage some of, some of the, the, the students, the attendees, to explore the repertoire. Wonderful, wonderful. Edward yeah. Grieg is one of the composers who are like a connection between the Mendelssohn Academy, yes. the Mendelssohn Hochschule, and exactly. Edition Peters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when did Grieg met Edition Peters first time? Well, obviously he was a student here at the Hochschule, um, and Max Hinrichsen, who was the uh, then owner of Edition Peters, had his eye on Grieg while he was a student here. And then a year after he left, he started to publish Grieg's music. And that was the beginning of an extraordinary, unique, lifelong relationship between composer and publisher. Um, and Grieg would come and stay with the, the family at the Great Talstrasse 10 once a year for six to eight weeks. He would compose, he would enjoy the amazing uh, cultural life of, of Leipzig, would meet other composers, Tchaikovsky, Brahms here. Um, and he, he just was adopted really by the family and also his wife, Nina, um, 
they would go on holidays together. They went to, touring the Italian lakes. Um, Henry Henriksen took Greek to Bayreuth. Um, it's an extraordinary rich uh, story and, and it's documented in over 400 letters between Grieg and the Henriksen family. Amazing. Um, so it's, it's a really special story that, yeah. that I, I love yeah. telling and I think, don't think that many people worldwide really understand mm. uh, what, um, what amazing inspiration can come between uh, publisher and composer. And this was really one of the first times it had happened. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so many great composers uh, worked with Edition Peters yeah. in past and still do. Yes. So, how many modern, currently living composers are under contract with Edition Peters? Yeah. So we have over sixty house composers. We call them. So we have really uh, cemented uh, long-term relationships with them. They're from all over the globe. Um, and obviously we have our three companies. We have the, the German company in Leipzig, we have the London company, and uh, really importantly for new music, we have the New York company, um, which uh, obviously published you know, such iconic composers, John Cage, George Crumb, Morton Feldman. Um, so those, th those three uh, dynamics go towards a great foundation for our living composer. Yeah. Um, and so Jonathan Dove, I think, is one of the ones that stands out uh, for, for, for pianists because he, he is a great opera composer, mm -hmm. but he's a great pianist. And he, he trained uh, um, uh, and was a repetiteur for, at Glyndebourne Opera House for 11 mm -hmm. years. And great artistic pianistic skills. So. Amazing. Linda, yeah. in case I yeah. would start to compose, which yes. fortunately I will never have the idea to do, you know, fortunately. Uh -oh. But if I would compose, what do I have to do to get an exclusive contract to Edition Peters as a composer? Oh, that's, uh, that's a big question. Um, I'll try and do a short answer. Um, obviously, we, we have many, many uh, approaches from, from young composers around the world. But I think what we're looking for is... Uh, uh, an integrity of compositional style mm -hmm. as much as possible, a real unique voice or elements of emerging that you would, would, would emerge as a, as, a, as a unique voice. Um, and also, you know, a really interesting uh, track record of uh, res you know, positive responses to your compositions and mm -hmm. also future commissions. I see. Yeah. I see. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think every pianist and maybe every classical musician grew up with scores <laughs> that have this iconic look, the, the, the green series, yeah. the famous green series. Yeah. And um, every one of us has so many, so many wonderful moments with pieces. And uh, of course, there are also other wonderful companies um, like Hähnle and uh, Breitkopf. But one of the most iconic for me personally is Edition Peters. That's why I'm so happy about the connection to Mendelssohn Academy. And I just wonder how many pieces in total are in the catalogue of Edition Peters? In total. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a really good question. And in a way, one one we're still trying to determine the answer to that because we've had such a extraordinary history as a as a company um obviously the the, the company was one of the most famous and uh illustrious um primarily based in germany in the 1930s but owned by a jewish family um, and it was one of the first companies in germany to go through the process of Aryanization. and 14 members of the Henriksen family were murdered in the Holocaust, um, including the owner, Henry Henriksen. There then followed a splintering um, of the company, um, and that's why uh, the companies were founded in London and New York, because they were founded by two of the sons who managed to escape. Um, and, but that meant, at some point, there were four Peters companies operating mm. in the world. Mm. 
There was the Leipzig Company still, post-war, in the GDR, that became the, the state publishing house. There was the, the West German Company in Frankfurt, and then there was London and New York. And each of them was sort of still under the brand, but they were sort of operating independently. Mm. Um, and so, yeah. finally, in 2010, we managed to unify the group, bring mm. the ownership back to the Hinrichsen Foundation and the surviving Hinrichsen heir in America, and we've gone through this wonderful process, and it will take us another two years, of actually defining what is the Edition Peters catalogue. And that, that actually hasn't happened since 1933. So my guess is that we'll end up at about 12,432. 12,000? Yes, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Of, of, of pieces that, once we've knocked out all the duplications from the, mm, the multiple I houses, see. and really curated the catalogue, um, so that obviously for some works we have four mm. editions in our history. For the Inventions and Symphonias, mm. uh, we have four editions. I see. The first one in 1932, which was the first ever Urtex publication. Mm. Um, mm. But then how relevant to all of those? Mm. Um, mm. So, so it's, a, it's a complex jigsaw mm. to put together, a very exciting one. Yeah, um, yeah. 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 Wow, that's, that's incredible. And for a pianist, of course, I'm especially interested in the piano yeah. catalog yeah. and um, because we know very well each other you you told me about the piano catalog yeah. and I was really really surprised about how you have done it really a very very warm congratulation to that okay. and if I may say that um, you did it as the We're managing director which is also with a wonderful team I with a wonderful, a team. wonderful wonderful team oh yeah yeah, yeah. 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 and um, so uh, what I found very 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 special here is that there is no separation between traditional composers and modern composers yeah. so you have the whole catalog and by the way I also think it's um, it, it's very beautifully designed. And so when, when I look at this catalog, I just feel so inspired to, because there are so many pieces. Yeah. I have to say, I don't know yet. So um, why did you do this piano catalog and what do you want to reach with it? We're really passionate about trying to encourage uh, musicians to really explore repertoire. A little bit further than the the known works, as it were, the the accepted canon. It's mm -hmm. an English term we would use mm -hmm. of, of uh, core repertoire, and I think all of all every musician has a responsibility to uh, work with the music of their time. Yeah. It's it's a really important. Uh, yeah. I, I personally, I studied contemporary mm. music uh, as a as a student, a specialisation, um, which which was absolutely fascinating. Didn't like all of it, but at least I engage with it. And uh, we're not saying you have to really, really be inspired by that, but you need to know what, what, what's being written and yeah, what works for you and what you think will work for your audiences. Yeah. Linda, I have one question to you. Yeah. Let's say I prepare my new recital yeah. and I want three of your favorite modern piano pieces in the program. What would you recommend? Well, I, I would actually um, highly recommend uh, one of the, the early pieces from, from John Cage, um, In a Landscape or Dream. They're mesmerising, they're thought-provoking, and they, they just complement so, so many other works, um, but they're very simple, and they're not what people expect from John Cage. Wonderful. I would... Yeah. You would recommend that. Oh, th yeah. May I yeah. stop you there? Mm. What could be a piece to balance that of the classical, traditional repertoire? What would you recommend in finding a good conception of a concert program for a pianist? Well, I, I, I feel that uh, either in a landscape or, or dream would, would just beautifully complement the Chopin Nocturne. Beautifully. They're, they're, they're the same... Um, it would sort of lead into the, 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 the Chopin um, uh, or possibly a Liszt Consolation. Wonderful. Chopin, we have, we have here 
from the new uh, Chopin edition. Yeah. Mm. Um, we had John Rink here, who yeah, did an yeah. amazing lecture. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, for the audience, John Rink will also be a part of one of our uh, video formats for Imal Digital. So I'm very, very much looking forward to that. And um, something on the cover is new, and it's the word urtext. Mm -hmm. And today, the word urtext is like a brand, like a symbol for quality. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, so everyone wants urtext, and everyone thinks if he buy urtext, doesn't matter from which publishing company, he's on the right side. But what is meant by urtext, and why is it not that easy? It's yeah. Thanks for asking the question. Um, obviously, there there are I don't know how many urtexts there's into Chopin, and they're all different because every urtext is an interpretation of the musicologist who provides the editorial work behind any urtext edition, um, and there is never one correct way. Everything can be debated. That's why we're very careful with our, our marketing. We never say. This is the definitive. The, the, this is where we want people to engage with, well, what was the composer saying? Um, and uh, what do the sources say? Um, and why is this musicologist said that, that he, the composer meant that when uh, Bernwriter or Hendler will say that they meant something else? They're all valid because they're musicologic, musicologists' train of thought. Um, but the idea that there's one urtext um, it, it is really false. So it's, it's um, as I said earlier, I mean, uh, Breitkopf and Hertel were the, the first uh, publishers to sort of come up with the concept of Urtex, but, but it was Peters in 1933 who created the first Urtex edition. But that's a world away from the musicology, musicological approach that, 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 that is now in use. So there are all these different stages of Urtex. It's mm. an amazing, fascinating subject but not as simple as people think. And it's yeah. sort of been, yeah. been uh, diluted down into a little marketing, yeah. marketing thing. Oh, Urtex, it must be, must be great. There's also another aspect, if I can continue. Please. <laughs> Which is that many of the older editions, uh, so pre-war and, and going back to 1874, but to the beginnings of the, um, uh, 1867, the beginnings of the, the Green Editions and Breitkopf before that, where... The editors of those days, they were working with the composers. They had direct connection with the composers. Like Emil von Sauer. Yeah, with, with, as, a, as a pupil yeah. of Liszt, yeah. yeah. And actually there's real value there. Yeah. Um, and so in England we say sometimes you throw out the baby with the bathwater, which is not such a good saying, but, but there is a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, and that's why we're very, very careful. We, don't, we take a long time to produce our text. We take great care. Mm. Um, and we, we also we try and f there's, a, there's a saying in the, the art world, which is a word called provenance. Mm. What's the provenance of, a, of an edition? So the old list editions by von Sauer, they have a value. It's, yeah. it's different. So, so it's a really mm. fascinating next few decades, I think, with musicology. Yeah. yeah. Well, and many of the criteria you write in the critical comment, yeah. the criteria about how you developed it. Yeah. And when you, I mean, this is a new, this is a new book, but yeah. I, I know it from my books, uh, which I'm working with. Um, during years, the pages are broken and yeah. so many annotations. And, but the critical comment is always never touched. You know, yeah, I see it also uh, with my students. So, yeah. Yeah. so why don't we read the critical comment? Why, or what are you doing to make the critical comment more interesting? Yeah. That, that the performing artists not only get a list of musicologist um, aspects where he asks himself, okay, but what does it mean for my interpretation? Yeah. How do you want to encourage people um, to read the critical comment? Comment. Yeah, I, th I think this is where publishers have been really, really let everybody down. Really, we've just, you know, it's a very dry um, and, and adherence to musicological principles, and we've been really bad about getting people excited about actually what is in the in in the um, in the critical commentaries. And that's why we've done the series of composer days here uh, at the Hochschule, 
um, and I've done many tours uh, around the world with the musicologists, because once uh, you have a, a room full of piano teachers, what wonderful experiences I had with John Rink, inspirational experiences in Japan with John, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, just bringing the critical commentary alive um, with master classes, but, but also with lectures and Q and A's. Um, and then, of course, with John, wonderful performances. That's the amazing mm. thing about John, illustrating yeah. the musicology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think we have to be better as publishers about getting people excited about what's actually the critical, yeah. what, what the critical is actually, not even saying, but asking you to think about, to yeah. be a really yeah. a questioning musician. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, John, it's not only a great musicologist, he's a wonderful pianist yep. too, when, when he plays, yeah. it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. And um, I remember your wonderful lecture about Urtext in the, during the last Mendelssohn Academy for the participants. It was so interesting to be in the headquarter of Edition <laughs> Peters and yeah. to be in contact um, with one of the most important figures in music publishing um, um, aspects. Linda, thank you so much for joining pleasure. us for this video. Absolutely it was pleasure. a great pleasure to talk to you. We are very, very happy about the collaboration. We are looking forward for many great projects between the Mendelssohn Academy and Edition Peters. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.